Hi, I'm Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and today we look into the Comic Con trailer of Amazon's The Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power show which will be out in September. You could ask, if a trailer breakdown is 2 hours long, is it really a trailer breakdown? Especially if the trailer is only 2 minutes long. Well, that is a question for another video, but it's still complicated. I also mainly focus on what is written in the books and compare that and also freestyle everything as last time so I can produce this video a lot faster. But before we start, a few hints as always. I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it. Shoutouts to the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks like Kimberly 80, Ted Naismith, Danny Dolphin, Sara Morello, Firat Solhan and all the others. Also, spoiler warning, I at least assume you have seen The Lord of the Rings and know the implications of that, but um, I try to avoid spoilers when it comes to what might be big arcs or surprises, though this is definitely not a spoiler-free breakdown. So keep this in mind. But let us start. The trailer starts with an impressive scene. We see Galadriel holding the helmet of a soldier in her hand and she puts it onto a very large pile of other helmets in a barren wasteland. This instantly reminded me of an illustration of Ted Naismith of the so-called Hausen Dengin, the Hill of the Slain, which is described in the Silmarillion. But there are some differences compared to the books and what we see here. One might be that in the book the hill consists out of the dead bodies, out of the corpses of men and elves which were slain and died in the battle of Annambet Tears, the Nirnais Arnödiad, which was a very devastating loss of the forces of the elves and men that fought against the first Dark Lord Morgoth in the First Age in Beleriand. So just to give you some context, the Lord of the Rings plays in the Third Age, the Rings of Power will play in the Second Age and before that obviously was the First Age. And that ended with the so-called War of Wrath in which the forces of good from the West Continent also intervened and helped the elves. And in the end the First Dark Lord was defeated and banned into the Void. However in the process of this war the land Beleriand, which was the old west coast area of Middle Earth, got completely devastated, destroyed and sunk into the ocean. And after that the Blue Mountains became the new west coast of Middle Earth. So just to give you an idea where this was exactly and as a result the hill of the slain is also sunk into the ocean and not there anymore in the second age. However, if we return to this for a moment, like the battle of Unnumbered Tears and the hill of the slain. As said, the orcs of Morgoth took all the dead bodies of the fallen elves and men and their equipment and swords and piled them to a large hill and the area in the battle was completely devastated and became like a desert or a desolated wasteland as we see it here in this scene. But interestingly something unusual happened and grass started growing over this hill and this is this happens in some other occasions in the Silmarillion as well and this hill then became like a memorial of the tears and sadness and of the defeat of the elves and as a result it becomes part of the mythology of the law of the elves and Tolkien is a lot about mythology and creating it, especially in his writings about the first age. The context of this war and all these battle in the first age, battles in the first age is really complex, complex and complicated. So I can't really give you a really good overview, but in the previous trailer breakdown, which went far too long, um, I discussed some of these details already, like the two trees of Valinor, um, and we also discussed the Dagor Bragolach, the Battle of Sudden Flame. So there was a couple of big battles and important battles in the first age. The Battle of Sudden Flame was the first turning point. Until this point um, the elves did a pretty good job at fighting Morgoth, I guess for the most part. And after that battle where also two brothers of Galadriel died, um, it went downhill for them. And this, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, which, is all, which also references an old prophecy for the um, elven clan, the Noldor elves, um, it became like 
really a low and after that the elves didn't really recover from from this loss. There are some other um, battles and contexts here but it's it's really complicated. Also her other brother Finrod was already dead at the time of this particular battle. When it now comes to the whole Amazon context of this, Amazon only has the rights to the Lord of the Rings, the Appendices and the Hobbit. As a result they don't have rights to some of those scenes that are described in the Silmarillion, which is the Law of the Lord of the Rings, the book. The Battle of Unnumbered Tears, the Hill of the Slain is to my knowledge not mentioned. So I assume that they might put all of these battle into the War of Wrath, which is mentioned in the Lord of the Rings. So as said, we have the B Battle of Sudden Flame, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears and then a bit later at the very end the War of Wrath. And I assume for the book fans they just put little references into this. I would assume this is a flashback and um, we have something like a prologue like we had in Lord of the Rings and Galadriel narrates this and we see some pictures. Probably she doesn't even mention that this is a hill of the slain or maybe there's some reference in what she's talking about. But I could imagine that the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, the Hill of the Slain, the Battle of Sudden Flame is not directly named and it's just more an, a, a vague explanation of what happened leading to the War of Wrath. But that's just uh, my theory here. If we go at the, to the beginning of the trailer we recognize these helmets. We have seen other scenes for example with this a blonde elf in this big battle against orcs in, from the first teaser. These helmets look quite similar. We also see this star here and what this makes it kind of interesting is that I assume this references Feanor. There's the so, the so called star of Feanor and Feanor is the uncle, the, the half brother of Galadriel's father um, and he's a very important elf for the first age and also his seven sons. There's like a very huge story arc surrounding those which is too big to just summarize here. I briefly tried to cover this um, in the last breakdown but um, you will hear the name Fean or probably um, another time uh, in this trailer again. So maybe keep that in mind and Feanor was I would say he was mad, he was crazy. He was not like a very friendly elf who helps everyone and has is very wise and has good advice. He was like the crazy elf that um, was at some point on revenge and did everything to reach his goals and Galadriel did not really like Feanor and I guess there are some, their half brothers also had like, let's say not the best relationships to to, to Feanor, like Galadriel's father and also um, Galadriel's other uncle um, Fingolfin. But I really appreciate that we um, see this scene here because it really surprised me and it looks pretty cool and gets a point across. I had, a, I had the theory that a reason why they might have not shown a hill made out of actual corpses is that probably for age rating reasons in different countries and of course they show this trailer on Comic Con where probably also a lot of um, children and younger people attend so they probably don't want to disturb them and just brought their point across this reference across by just um, showing it like this but in my opinion this is clearly a reference to the Hill of the Slain. If Galadriel was still in Beleriand at the time of the Battle of Unnumbered Tears is very hard to say and a topic for another video. I also had the theory that she maybe put the helmet of her brother onto this hill, though in the scenes we have seen so far he does not wear a helmet so I don't know. But let us continue. In the next scene we see this here and this we already knew from the um, other teaser and trailers already. We've seen it several times and in my opinion this is Lindon. Lindon is one of several elven realms in the second age and I mentioned the, the loss of the old west coast area of Middle Earth and the Blue Mountains and the Blue Mountains got split and there's a bay in it and in this bay and surroundings that is Lindon. And the elves live there and you see the mountains here in the background are pretty much fitting to, to this. And this is where hiking, the hiking of the Noldor elves in Middle-earth Gil-galad lives. And also Elrond is in his service which we will see also here um, in a moment. There are other elven realms like Eregion a bit east of that 
but still west of the Misty Mountains. And then beyond the Misty Mountains, we have Los Lorien and of course um, Thranduil's realm. Here we have Elrond and maybe some persons in his service because the clothing looks somewhat similar to Elrond. And as said, he is in the service of the High King of the Noldor, Els Gilgalad, who is this person here in the background. We have talked about him several times now and he puts laurels on Galadriel's head. It's like, I don't know, a ceremony. Maybe he sends Galadriel and her companions into the West, to the West continent to get help, which is a common theme from the um, from the Silmarillion in the First Age. And the elves though in the First Age, the Noldor elves were banned from entering Aman. And as a result, all their ships and efforts sunk and uh, many sailors of the elves died in the waters because um, they were not allowed to return to the West continent. So this might also happen to Galadriel, which would be strange and in my opinion not really fitting to the second age, but I could imagine the show goes for it because we see Galadriel on a boat and potentially sailing west and I can make no sense out of that otherwise. Another option would be she's sent to Numenor for, di for a diplomatic mission by her high king in Middle Earth. Definitely also a possibility. Also, this person here we might see in the trailer later as one of Galadriel's companions. So keep maybe um, his profile here in mind. Another small detail is that these elves here don't seem to wear their leg armor pieces. So you can see their actual legs which uh, shimmering through their garment, which is in my opinion quite funny. But let us move on. The next scene we have also seen on um, a published um, screenshot of an article already. And that is the dinner of important elves. Here we already uh, we see again Gilgalad and Elrond. And then we have um, Prince Durin the Force, which we will discuss later. And here sits Celebrimbor. Um, he is the Lord of Eregion and leader of the jewel smiths of Eregion, the Gwais Imerdain. I usually call it like a jewel smith's guild. And he and his guild were the creators of the Rings of Power. He especially is known for creating the three elven rings of power, but he probably also created the others or some others. It's hard to tell how big his involvement was in, in, in the creation of certain rings but yeah he plays an important role because he is um, a lord of an elven realm though in the unfinished tales there is a version where Galadriel and Celeborn go with him and together they found Eregion so I guess they all kind of are rulers over that. I'm not sure how the show will handle that because that is far less um, described in the Lord of the Rings itself. It's more like Tolkien really tried to find a good place for Galadriel in his um, earlier history of his world and um, for that I guess he moved um, her there and put it put connected her to the plot. But as said that is a difficult topic. Potentially they don't have the rights to, to, to these versions anyway. We see these white trees in the background. I mentioned that in previous videos and some might think hmm, these are white or maybe silver trees with yellow or golden leaves that are probably uh, Malorn trees or Melurn. But according to the unfinished tales that can that can't be the case because uh, once they were gifted indeed um, as saplings to or little nuts I think gifted to Gil-galad by the Numenorians, but he could not grow them in his realm Lindon. Then later he gave them to Galadriel and she took them to Los Lorien and there she was able to grow them and Los Lorien became kind of known for them. But as a result they should not be in Lindon, but that's just a minor detail and as said they probably don't have um, access or rights to the unfinished tales material anyway. Also really like these lamps I have to admit. I think a lot of people really like them. And we see um, two persons here in the background. One is I think holding a flute. It's really hard to see but if you zoom in she has an instrument. And I think he also has maybe like an instrument here. So they make the music here. Pretty nice detail there in the background. And we also see these four women around the table. I assume they are just in the service of Gilgalad or another high ranking elf. Because we also see them in some other scenes in the black, uh, in the background and their white veils are very, um, yeah, they stick out quite a bit. All the others seem to be, be not be veiled, but they are. And uh, we see, the, see them in quite a few scenes actually in the background. So maybe they're also guards or something. Relatively interesting. 
Also, this woman here, some might speculate it's Galadriel or not, maybe it's like another um, elven noble, hard to tell. Also, here sits another person. Some speculate this might be Tarmiriel, which um, is quite interesting. Tarmiriel would not, would never uh, visit Lindon because that seems not fitting into her time. Though in earlier areas, we definitely know that uh, Numenorean kings or princes uh, visited uh, Lindon. But let us move on, um, as else we, we never get through this video. Here we see um, a bunch of elven children. Um, these must be elven children because um, this girl here at least has pointy ears and um, it's otherwise very hard to see. And um, pointy ears are def definitely described in letters and notes by Tolkien for elves and for hobbits. So I, if I remember correctly, the hobbit ears are not as pointy as the elven ears. That is how Tolkien phrased it. It's not an invention by Peter Jackson. Some people seem to um, assume this, but... Um, yeah, and they seem to maybe follow this little... It's called a little boat made out of paper. Really hard to tell, but they seem to have a good time. So I'm happy for them. Next scene, um, we can maybe insert the Numenorean section. I already mentioned that Gilgalad got a gift from Numenor. So what is Numenor? First of all, I know that this scene must be Numenor related because we see these the clothes of them has this green bluish um, color and we see exactly this color on Isildur while he's standing on a ship in another trailer scene from a I think it was a main teaser where we had this scene. I will show it to you here in post production and from also the other sailors on the ship wear this uniform. So it was clearly the Numenorean ship. We know Isildur is from Numenor as a result. That m must be um, true for those sailors here too. They maybe put a banner or something onto the ground. Basically they landed on Middle Earth. We see a beach here. We see these landing boats I assume. And they say yeah we landed here. That's ours now. This is our banner or something. One possibility, maybe Tarmiriel lands on Middle-earth and this is like a carpet where she walks over. Um, would be another possible interpretation. But yeah, I don't know. And this, by the way, the symbol here, we might see later in the trailer again. Let me just go back a moment. Um, we might see later in the trailer again. So keep this in mind. I We discuss this later. But I wanted to explain what is Numinor. It's always a bit complicated to explain this in detail and there are a lot of information to unpack we might need later for other topics in this video. So here a small law exposition section. So Numinor is an island between the west continent Amman and the continent of Middle-earth. So it's in the middle of the ocean between these two continents. And the origin story of this island is basically that in the first age a group of men fought with the forces of good against the first Dark Lord Morgoth who was a big antagonist of the first age. Though at some point it went pretty downhill as, I, as mentioned earlier in this breakdown and then the forces of good from the west continent Aman intervened due to reasons that have to do with the parents of Elrond. On the west continent, that's a bit complicated, there lives there live spirit beings besides elves and these spirit beings are, I usually compare them to angels because there's one almighty creator god called Eru Iluvatar and these entities serve him. These spirit beings called Ainur divide into I guess several groups and there are the highest rank angels, the high angels, the powers of the world called the Valar and, and, then, and then there are also the Mayar um, who serve those Valar and of course Eru as well. So there is like a ranking and these high powers decided to send um, the Maiar and elves from the west continent to Middle-earth and then the War of Ra started. Morgoth got defeated and thrown into the void. Good examples for Maiar are for example Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast, the two blue wizards, but also the Balrogs or um, Sauron himself. I think in the show we haven't really seen Valar, but Morgoth himself was once part of the group of the Valar, but he got kicked out. Still, he is the most powerful um, of this group, or was. So after this War of Ra's, the men who helped the forces of good, the Edain, 
got a gift. First of all, their lifespan was restored to what it was before the fall of man, so it got longer. And they got an island to dwell on in peace, which were created by these angels in the middle of the ocean between the West Continent and uh, Middle Earth. And this was called Númenor or became uh, Númenor, which basically means Westland. And then they settled there. And because they were in the service of the elves, they were they had the knowledge of the elves and were in of itself pretty advanced. So while they now were able to live in peace on this island, they could advance even further as a civilization. And they also became a seafaring nation as a result of living on an island. And in addition, they were also visited by the by some of the elves from the West Continent, from Tol Eresia, I guess. And they also brought them, I assume, some knowledge, because these elves were from the West Continent and in contact with these high angels, so they were also extremely knowledgeable. And they also brought them some gifts, like seven Palantiri, the seeing stones, which we'll discuss in a moment, and the white tree of Nimlos, which we also will discuss, because both of... Both of these gifts are um, in the trailer, which is pretty cool, my opinion. And yeah, this is basically a very basic outline of the story of Númenor. And um, the twin brother of Elrond became the first king of Númenor because he decided to be counted towards men, while Elrond decided to be counted towards elves. So Elrond is related to the line of kings of Númenor, which is also an interesting detail. And Tarmiriel is the queen the ruling queen of Númenor in the show Rings of Power, but she is the ruling queen at the very, very end of the show, uh, of the arc of Númenor, not of the show. Like, it's very late in the Second Age. I guess they ignore the time and do a lot of time compression, but just for context of the book perspective, um, that is an important detail to notice, that we are at the very end of the Númenorian arc here. But however, let us um, move on uh, further. This was like a long excursion. But some of these details will um, haunt us through this uh, trailer analysis and breakdown. So here on this ship we see, a, I assume, a bunch of elves and especially Galadriel. We have seen this scene from multiple angles already, but never what they were looking at. And they look at it in these other scenes in absolute amazement. And it never made really sense and it still doesn't because it seems there's just the sun, uh, maybe um, the sunset or um, the sun is rising, hard to tell. And that is really strange. In context of the books, if we see Galadriel on a ship, she sails towards the sunset. There's only one scene that comes into mind. And that is, of course, at the very end of the Lord of the Rings in the third, which plays in the third age. Um, she sails to the west continent Aman and leaves Middle-earth, which all elves have to do at some point, I guess. And that is the only thing. So maybe this is some kind of vision of the future, but I guess it, there are also some details that don't really align with that idea well. It could be that at the very be there's one version in the Unfinished Tales where Galadriel sails from the west uh, continent Aman to Middle-earth. So maybe she sails east, though that this version is unfinished tales. In the other versions, she walks and is not on a ship. In general, there are no mentions of any, sh any trips b um, by ship of Galadriel, I know of, especially not in the Second Age. I wouldn't say that she just sit in one place all the time in the Second Age, but going on the sea sailing somewhere seems very unusual for her, I would say. There is a theory that Galadriel might be sent by Gilgalad in the show to sail to the west to get help. But as I said, that is a topic of the first age, not of the second age. In the first age, elves were banned from sailing back to the west continent, Aman. And when doing, um, due to this, there were storms and their ships got sunk and all the sailors drowned, except for um, one Voronwe. There's a story also... Um, around him and Elrond's grandfather, a more a first age topic. The second age and the ban of Galadriel is a complicated one, but we also see Galadriel on a raft and being basically in the ocean, in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by water. That is um, maybe some idea. Maybe she sails on a diplomatic mission to Númenor and for that she has to go west from the perspective of Middle-earth, of course. Maybe that is what she's seeing. Maybe she sees slowly the coastline of Númenor it's pretty hard to tell. I find it like it's a beautiful shot and everything makes kind of sense from 
the perspective of elven culture, but in the chronology, it makes absolutely no sense. So very curious how this is resolved in the show. But let us uh, move on further. The next two scenes, one with Sadok and one with Bronwyn and Arondir, um, all characters that are not in the book, we discussed in previous trailers quite a bit, so I will skip them here. Then, um, yeah, now we finally move to what we discussed for so long, Numinor. So this place now on the island Numinor. In the show, every time we see something Numinor, we see um, certain things. We see usually a lot of blue, maybe a bit of golden in their banners and so on. And we also see often a sun symbol. And if we move a bit further to the um, right again, we see also here on the other side is a sun symbol and a writing. This was, I, I heard in an interview from the Comic Con that it was invented for the show. There's another system invented for Numinor. Not sure if it's this one. It doesn't look like it, to be honest. And Tolkien um, himself never had, I think, really a, a writing system dedicated for Numinor. Maybe there are some notes on this. Tolkien, I'm not sure, but um, kind of unusual. Sadly, I can't tell you what's written there, though I would be curious. Then on the roof here itself, we also see like potentially a sun. Definitely Numinor. Here is a little river and here's a little arena or so. And we see a tower which we'll discuss in a moment. And what is potentially stored in this tower has a tradition to be stored in towers. But um, yeah, it completely makes sense. And further, um, it's hard to tell where this is. Like, there's a lot of speculation that I could do here. We see a little mountain part. So I would assume this is the capital of Numinor, Armenilos, because it is close to the main mountain in the middle of Numinor called Meneltarma. It's southeast of it and um, yeah, pretty pretty close to the outliers of the, of the mountain. And there are even some tombs in the mountain um, itself and Armenilos is close to those. However, Armenilos itself is not a harbor city really and it's debatable if there was a river inside um, the capital. There is a river close, but in most illustrations I know of, it's further west of Armenilos and not going through the capital. But I guess you could make it work somehow. Definitely, you could make an argument for that. Um, we have seen in other trailer scenes before. Um, maybe we just move back to the one of the first uh, to the first teaser. We have seen this place, and here we also see the sun symbol here and the ship starting. And yeah, this I ident identified as Romena, which is the harbor city. And this is at the east coast of Numinor. At the west coast of Numinor, we find another important city, which is also a harbor city, and that is um, Andunie where the lords of Andunia are from, and one of the lords of Andunia we know that's Elendil. So if we return to this particular scene here, um, and move forward, here we basically see Tarmiriel, the ruling queen of Númenor, I mentioned her, and this is Galadriel. And as said, they would not have met if we go by the books, in my opinion. They are maybe in this tower or on this other building, hard to tell, but I, my bet would be on the tower. And here in the background, maybe we see some decoration, like the windows and the decorations in front of that. Hard to tell. Because we see something blue here, so maybe this is outside. That's also why I get the feeling that this room they are standing in might be relatively small, so like in a tower. And this object here has a tradition to be stored in a tower. And look at her face. It's one of the uh, Palantiri. And she looks like, oh, I know that because these Palantiri were created by her uncle Feanor, which we also mentioned um, in the trailer. And these stones have some complicated properties, which, which are highly difficult to summarize, I guess. But what you could do with them is basically you could see distant places of the present, distant, there was some limitations to the distance and it could look through objects like mountains and so on, but it needs like what you look at, there needs to be light to see something. There was the possibility of very powerful entities being able to somehow block the vision of a Palantir. How that works though, um, Tolkien never explains, it's a mystery, but it's possible. And we also know that it 
stores what it has seen. So you can basically look into the past with it as well, as long as the Palantir has seen the past or was used in the past, if that makes sense. You can also use it to communicate um, with other seeing stones and transfer your thought basically. Usually images of what you see or what is seen by the Palantir, but uh, mostly, but you, it seems like Tolkien makes like a little exception, says yeah, you could also transfer thought with it and so communicate to some degree. Though he mentions that sound is not transferred. So that is an important detail to keep in mind. And they were described as perfect spheres. Some of them of different size though. There was uh, some of the um, Palantiri were so big that not a single person could not lift them up. So this seems to be one of the smaller um, seeing stones. What is further important in this context is a Numenor, as said, um, the elves from Tol Eresia gifted seven seeing stones to Numenor, and this is one of them. So it makes completely sense that we see them in Numenor. Later they are brought to Middle Earth, and then we have them in Gondor and uh, Arnor. We, the most famous one everyone might know who have seen the films is the one in Orthanc in Isengard or Isengard that is used by Saruman and that is one of those. Maybe it's exactly this stone. They changed the design and make, made it a bit more bluish though it's described as black spheres um, uh, in the unfinished tales but I don't mind that. I think they, the seeing stone looks pretty cool. There's one seeing stone left at least one we know of um, in on the West Continent, Amanso, there are at least eight seeing stones, though on Numinor and later on um, Middle-earth there are only seven. Um, also keep the dress of Ga the look of Galadriel's dress in mind. Maybe I just try to get um, a bit back and see, we see it here from the side, look at her shoulder. And yeah, in the scene, now she puts her hand on the Palantir. She talks to Miriel while doing so. And what I also noticed, it is somewhat reminiscent of Peter Jackson's depiction. Though she doesn't do the Christopher Lee Saruman move with her hand, but she could have, for example, touched the seeing stone with both hands. So they could have definitely tried to go for something different because in some interviews the showrunner said, we tried to not remake Peter Jackson or be in Peter Jackson's world. We tried to do something new, if I remember correctly. And... For that, I feel like in the trailer so far, they put in a lot of references to Peter Jackson's uh, Peter Jackson films, like this, in my opinion, but also like there was one Italian shot in the previous trailer of Galadriel and so on. Just kind of interesting. Uh, let's move on now to what she uh, sees, because there is a lot to discuss here. And the video is already pretty long. But yeah, I try to hurry myself a little bit here. First of all, she sees herself in it, like in this crystalline structure with see Galadriel and there are some, I assume, blue pillars or something in the background. That is somewhat reminiscent of the throne room of Tarmiriel on Númenor. It's also, we know, oh, I assume Galadriel gets this particular dress in Númenor, so it makes sense that she sees herself also on Númenor. But um, yeah, more I can't really um, see here, though I really like the effect, I have to admit. And then and we see some scenes. It's hard to tell if this is from the prologue now or if this is actually what she sees using the Palantir. Pretty difficult to tell. So um, yeah, we see this huge battle. As said, um, we discussed this earlier in this breakdown that the uh, these large, there were set a lot of large battles um, in the first age. And I assume this is one of the battles. Maybe this here is actually um, Finrod here or somewhere we might see him in this um, big battle. And I assume though for the show they have to all call it a War of Ras because that's the only big battle of the First Age mentioned or one of the few mentioned in the um, uh, in the Lord of the Rings and they only have the rights to that. Though if Finrod is in this particular battle it can't be the War of Ras. Finrod was already um, dead and reincarnated on the West Continent or re-embodied, I should say, reincarnated is the wrong term. He was re elves get re-embodied on the West Continent when they die and were good elves, else they have to stay um, in the so-called halls of Mandos, but complicated topic. 
So he was not there. It can't be the Battle of Anambetirs because he was already dead there as well. It could only be the Emdagor Bragolach, which is the Battle of Sudden Flame. There he was still alive. But yeah, here we see another weird scene cut in between. I assume this is because we know Arondir gets captured by the orcs and we see him in another scene chained and we see in the background this this kind of ceiling consisting out of, I don't know if it's leather or cloth or something. Hard to tell, but we see this particular style of ceiling in other scenes with Arondir. So that has completely nothing to do with um, the first age battle, but it's definitely um, a scene about um, this prison, orc prison camp the um, Arondir is brought to, I assume. And then here we see him again, Finrod. That is, I assume, Galadriel's brother. It's not official, but most people assume he must be Finrod. I assume he gets slain in this particular battle, though his actual death scene is different. He gets not slain in a battle, but he is on a quest with a hero of men called Beren. And Beren is one of the ancestors of, for example, Elrond, but also of Aragorn. And they though got into, get into a lot of trouble and get captured by Sauron. And he puts them into prison and sends a powerful wolf, a werewolf. Don't think of wolves that are killed with a silver bullet, but just think of a very big and powerful wolf. Sauron had multiple of those wolves and there were also companions of uh, Beren and Finrod and Sauron sent the werewolves into the pits where those were chained and one by one the companions were slain by the werewolves and when a werewolf came to kill Beren, Finrod managed to free himself and wrestled with a werewolf, killing it with just his bare hands and teeth, but got wounded in the process and died. And so he basically fulfilled his debt that he had um, towards the father of Beren, who also saved once his life. And now he was able to save the life of Beren's, uh, of Barahir's son Beren. And interestingly, maybe people know the ring of Barahir from the Lord of the Rings. This ring was the gift that Finrod gave to Beren's father as a token of his gratitude and it is the ring of Finrod's um, father's house, so the ring of, Finar uh, of the house of Finarfin. Very interesting how all these details are combined. And I think in the Lord of the Rings there is also a mention of this to some degree, but the story is of course not fully told there. So I guess it's hard to tell what they can tell and to what they have rights there. There was another scene, because these scenes are just a few frames long, it's nightmarish to find them here live. Um, this scene we discussed in the last breakdown, it might be the sinking of Beleriand into the ocean, because we see like buildings here and structures and a lot of dead people um, in, uh, swimming in the water. And there's a water surface up here, it moves if you look closely. And Another option would be it is the very end of the Numenorean arc. I don't want to talk or spoil too much here, but um, yeah, that might also be that. We also might see some ship here, like this could be a part of a ship. So I think the latter one, the end of the Numenorean arc, is very, very likely for this scene. Let's move on. Oh, we skipped it. Galadriel shedding some tears over her uh, dead, uh, over the, the corpse of her brother. And... Um, yeah, we also, first detail, here in the background we see again these um, veiled women, which we have also to some degree seen in previous scenes. So I assume these really are in the service of like Galadriel or a king or whatever. Um, kind of interesting. He was also a king, he was a king of Nargothrond. And we know that before the fall of Nargothrond, um, she left Beleriand. So as early I said, maybe it's unlikely that she has seen um, the Hill of the Slain herself because she could have already left this first age um, place to go further east. Definitely a possibility. However, um, I have, I have cool, some cool references are here. I talked about him getting killed by a werewolf and we see like claws on his wounds on his arm. And these wounds could be from a werewolf or something. So this is maybe just a reference for us law fans who have read the Silmarillion um, to say, ah, okay, this might be an implication how he, have, how he has died. Maybe it's not explained at all. That is what I would expect. And um, people would assume he died in battle. Um, 
which is like the implication, but they have a little reference for us. Pretty cool. We also see the dagger that Galadriel carries around later. We also will see this in the trailer again. And um, a detail I missed in my live stream, sadly. Let me just see if I'm here right. I zoom in a bit. It's a bit difficult to zoom here live, but here. Keep this symbol here in mind, like the form of it. It's like a U and then there's like a line in it that sticks out a bit, like a, ver a vertical line. Something like that. Maybe there's something here down. Keep this symbol in mind. It's pretty hard to see, but we'll show you maybe later in the trailer what this symbol might be. And keep in mind that in the books and maybe even in the Rings of Power series, um, he is potentially killed by Sauron. So or Sauron is responsible for his death. So uh, we keep this detail in mind and then we uh, slowly move on. Next scene would be another gift. Like we talked about the Palantir as one of the gifts. And I also mentioned already the white tree Nimlos. And if you think of Gondor, there's also this wizard white tree in Gondor. Um, and this tree in Gondor is related to this one here, which is I mean, it's not the OG white tree, to be honest. That would be um, Telperion, one of the two trees of Valinor, and then there are some others. This white tree has literally a family tree, so pun intended. Interestingly, the tree losing leaves, like there is a prophecy of um, Tarmiriel's father, I think, who was Tar Palantir, if I'm not mistaken, and he said when this tree would die, then the end of Numenor would come. And it losing um, flowers or leaves is definitely could be seen as a bad omen. And she sees this and she doesn't look like, oh, it's it's getting autumn. The tree loses uh, leaves. It looks more like, oh, not good. And here, this is, of course, again, Tarmiriel. We see also a guard. We have seen this scene from another angle in previous trailers. And now we see what she's looking at. The other trailer made it look like she looks at the meteor, but here I assume it becomes clear she definitely looks at these leaves falling down. I said in previous um, breakdown that it would be strange if this would be Nimlos because it, it's, um, Nimlos is in Armenilos, in the capital, and close to the, or in the gardens of the, um, of the palace. And this looks like not a street that is right next to the gardens of the palace, but that seems to be the case. And here we see her first cousin, Farazon. These two are cousins. And um, yeah, so both are royals. Nobody else is around. We have guards. Maybe it, it's, it is a palace. Let's just assume it is, even though I would have imagined the street looks um, a bit not really palace-like, if that makes sense. But let us move on. This scene here is very speculation heavy and I can already spoil, I can only give you my theories and ideas. I have no idea who this is exactly. What I will try though is maybe work out some ideas and give you what this might reference in the books, but that's all I can do. My first thought was she looks from her dress or this person here, these persons here look like priests or something. She looks more like a warrior, but these two here definitely are more on the priest side of things. Maybe some obscure cult or something. I don't know. And if we move further, we also see a close-up of this person. And later in the trailer, we have another shot. And that is this one here. We skip ahead. And here we see this person blowing some air into the hand and smoke and sparks emit. And we see the hand is also slightly black. And when I saw when I saw this scene here, I definitely thought, okay, that must be Sauron. Because Sauron is also described as having a black hand and he burns Gilgalad with it um, at the very end of the War of the Last Alliance. In addition, he also could make use of fire. We can also read um, about this. So the association, Sauron, fire, definitely makes sense. Peter Jackson made heavily use of the idea uh, of the fiery red I, though there is some foundation for that in the books, but it's not like it's more like a symbolism in the book and Peter Jackson derived his idea from that, at least to some degree. However, I was sure that must be Sauron. Then I noticed <laughs> after my chat hinted me at this that this is not a dude. Like if you look at her silhouette, 
it's a female, definitely. For, I don't know how to phrase it better, but she has breasts. It's as simple. In the next shot, you can we can see her face quite well, and she doesn't look very friendly. So I would assume she's also maybe one of the bad guys. And we know the actress that portrays this character is called, and maybe I mispronounce her name, but I think it's Bridey Sisson. I link her Instagram in the in the description, so you can check that out, or maybe compare her face to that. But the eyebrows and the nose. Definitely her, like there's no doubt about this, at least this shot. Definitely her. And the other shot where she blows into her hand as well. So that is, um, there's no doubt about it. The problem is, well, we know that Sauron could change his physical form. He's also a Mayar, so an angel of lower rank, just an evil one, and um, serving uh, Morgos, and then later does his own thing and becomes the next or the second Dark Lord. And we know that in the first age, for example, he could transform himself into a wolf, a snake, a bat, and so on. And we know from the second age that, that he also has a form he um, uses there. So tricks, being a little trickster, um, fooling people, taking different forms is definitely a thing that Sauron could do. And interestingly, though, the spirit beings have no physical form at the beginning and then when they come to Arda they take a physical form. And they can also change this. That is not too unusual for them. Though there is in the Silmarillion a description that I wouldn't say it limits it but gives a hint how, how it works if they are male or female. Tolkien describes that their spirit has some kind of gender. He calls it a temper. And depending on this temper of their spirit, it, is deci it decides if they are male or if their physical form is male or female. It's not the physical form that they take that decides what gender they will then have, but it's, a, it's already then their spirit in some way. And as a result, Sauron was male, so he, may, he might not be able to take a female form, but I don't know this exactly. This quote only says about they took these form accordingly to their spirit, I'm not sure if you can interpret as, it as a law or a limit to their power. Maybe as these spirit beings were able to actually also took a female form. That is also like in mythology not unheard of. If you for example think of Norse mythology and of Loki, he was able to take female forms as well. And Tolkien took definitely some inspiration from uh, Norse mythology here and there. Really hard to tell if it's possible, but I would say he can turn to a snake, into a wolf, into a bat. Why shouldn't he be able to turn into a female form? Like, in theory, I would say, yeah, maybe-ish. So that could work. However, there's another detail here that I also overlooked, which might go, um, yeah, which also confirms, in my opinion, somewhat that this person standing here on this rock is the same person that when we see later creating this fire and um, smoke in her hand. Let me just skip there again, like this one here. You see the hand is slightly black in this scene. Here it is interestingly, if I'm not completely mistaken, which I could, it might be um, the left hand, I think. And if we go back to this other scene here, we see her right hand. And if we zoom in quite a bit, we also see it could be maybe the light or so, that's a possibility, but it looks kind of black. Like her hand also looks black here. I think we don't see her other hand. Could be wrong though, but um, definitely um, it looks black. Like if we compare this to the other person's, like her hand, it doesn't look as black. So I, from, from my perspective, there's definitely a difference here. Assuming that she does some fire magic, maybe her hand is always black. Maybe that is a thing. And it's probably both hands because if I'm not mistaken, that is her right hand, not the left hand. Or that that would be a continuation um, mistake here. But um, I don't know. Also, these two here, I can't really make much sense out of it. She looks a bit more like the warrior type, like a knight with, with a helmet. And she here looks also like a priest and she has this plate in her hand, I can't tell you. Looks almost like an eye and I thought maybe that's the eye of Sauron or something. I don't know. She also has some some decorations here like um, a necklace or so and a staff 
was also a symbol that I can't really, um, like even if I zoom in, like the details are not good enough to really tell what's going on. If we would see this um, symbol we have discussed before, for example, on the body of um, Finrod, that would be um, maybe a very good indicator, I guess, but I don't know, we, we don't see it so far. Um, very curious. Next shot, we see her close up and here we see maybe a scorpion tail or something. Really hard to tell, but she doesn't look very friendly as said. Oh, that's too far. And yeah, also the eyes are very unusual. Hair color and eyebrow colors also very unusual. Blonde hair is usually something that only very certain groups have, of course. Among men, it's then more common. Among elves, that usually hints at them having Vanyar ancestors. And in this case here, it's not clear if she's man or elf. I would assume she's um, she belongs to the group of men, but we don't see her ears, which would have been like a good indicator. So um, I don't know. So some suggest some speculation who this might be. I th I don't think by now it's not. I think it's not Sauron. I heard the rumor that Sauron is played not by her, by another actor. So, and I said we have the argument of him being male and maybe taking a female form might be an issue. Maybe not. So who else could this be besides Sauron? We find a quote in the Silmarillion. Um, in the first age, also some men fought on the side of Morgoth, so on the side of evil, and were in his service. And when he got defeated, they managed to flee from Beleriand back east over the Blue Mountains. And there lived men that had nothing to do with the wars in Beleriand. However, we can read, and the evil men came among them and cast over them a shadow of fear, and they took them for kings. She doesn't look like a queen, I have to admit, but um, let, just from the idea that there are evil men that were once in the service of Morgos coming back to Eriador, maybe bringing also like a devotion of uh, to Mor towards Morgos, the first Dark Lord, with them. Maybe even to Sauron, the second Dark Lord. So there could be some form of cults. Like it's not explicitly mentioned. There's one mention of cults, different topic has to do with the blue wizards but however it's definitely a possibility that there might be like a priestess or priestesses of Morgos and there's like something going on they do evil things and just wait for his return or whatever definitely a possibility uh, in my opinion another um, possibility would be we have the quote about the Nazgul and they mention um, kings sorcerers and warriors of old so she could be simply some kind of sorceress that is mentioned there. So it seems in the world there were sorcerers in some form. And for example, there was also the mention that um, when Sauron in the Third Age returned and hid in Dol Guldur, some assumed he was a um, Nazgul or maybe some kind of necromancer that is like a dark sorcerer that has some powers that have to do with the dead in some form. So it seems that maybe even a man could be like men could get this knowledge and power in some shape or form. And um, maybe this is what they are referencing. If this is the case, maybe she becomes later one of the Nazgul. Definitely a possibility. In the books, though, we don't know who the Nazgul were. All we know about the identities of the Nazgul is we have Tolkien wrote that three of them were num once Numenorians, lords of Numenorians in some form. I would uh, make the argument that the term lords is in this case gender neutral because, for example, we also have the um, poem about the, the rings of power. Three for the elven kings under the sky. And Galadriel is a female and technically she is also not a king nor a queen. Maybe some of those terms can a bit can be a bit stretched. That's my opinion in the realm of the possible. So if the show comes up with a Nazgul, and we know the f the appearance of the first Nazgul is, I think, um, Second Age 2251, the first time they appeared. So we know the Nazgul are a topic of the Second Age in some form, though we don't we know nothing about them in this time. Only that they appeared once and what. The their active time is definitely the Third Age. So this might be one of them. I really like the theory, to be honest. 
So these were my very long thoughts on this character and as I said there's a lot of speculation about her. But let's move on. We see Moria, we have seen this and discussed this in previous videos, so I just briefly skip over it. I look forward to seeing Moria at its peak. That's the Moria is the Dwarven Kingdom and the dwarves call it Casa Doom. It's in the Misty Mountains and like it's the it's a kingdom of the Longbeards, which is a house of Durin. Durin was the eldest of the seven fathers of the dwarves and his line, his house, his kingdom was the most important kingdom of the dwarves we know about. About the other dwarven kings we know almost nothing. But there were uh, the other fathers and their lineage. It's a very complicated topic as well. But yeah, look, in Lord of the Rings we see it as like, a, like Moria means like dark pit and it was basically that in the third age. It was abandoned and there were evil creatures, it was dangerous and so on. A very dark place. And here we see it when it's full of life. And I'm looking so much, so forward to seeing this. Just just the visuals, just maybe diving. I hope they can nail it perfectly and you can really dive a bit with your mind into Moria. Um, that would be pretty awesome. Here we see another thing uh, that is a bit unusual. You see something is written up here and it's really hard to see. But yeah, here you can see it. And also here's something written. And there's one screenshot where you can read exactly this writing better. But it's a really strange writing. It's written in English and it's written inconsistently. So on this side we can read rule your action. And on the other side we can see as mahal. Technically it's written masal because for all the other Dwarven writings they use the uh, Moria mode of this writing system which is called in originally Kirs and it's an elven writing system but the Dwarves adopted it and made some changes to it and then it became known as Dwarf runes. However technically it's uh, Kirs and for the for the different dwarf, uh, Dwarven kingdoms and their and their requirements for a writing system, or for their needs of a writing writing system, they made some changes. There's one mode for, for example, Erebor, there's one for Moria, and there's a very old mode of it. And usually they use the Moria mode, but here with the name uh, Mahal, which is the name of the High Angel of Smithing, of Aule, one of the Valar, um, he is, co he is um, revered by the dwarves and um, because he created I guess, well, basically their bodies in the mythology. And of course the dwarves like smithing, so they also like Aule and they call him Mahal. However, the letter H in Mahal is um, an S in the, Mor in the Moria mode. And only in the very old mode it's an H. So that's very strange. What is also strange, you could argue, why is it written in modern English? Well, some of the writings the dwarves did were in other languages which is in the world of Tolkien represented by modern English or whatever your translation of, of the works of Tolkien you are reading or looking at. So you can make an argument for this that this is not written in the Dwarvish language in Kuzdul. What is strange though is that um, action is written phonetically but rule your is written um, not phonet, is, is written like in English. So there's an E, though the E is silent. That's really strange. Also the um, S is written as with, with an A and a Z. So also kind of phonetically. It's, really, it's a really weird writing. And yeah, just in case people wonder what is written there. If we move on, we see now the strangest thing. We see him from the front and he looks like a classic Dwarven King. Really like him. And that is Durin the third and here is Durin the first, uh, the fourth and that is very very strange and unusual. The reason for that is that in the Silmarillion we can read that the fathers of the dwarves, I don't have a better term for it, but they reincarnated, they were reborn at some point. I guess in s the reborn part is maybe debatable, let's not go into this detail, but usually the idea is because Durin is also called Durin the Deathless, which is actually written here on this collar thing he has around his neck. And um, that is because he just returns. So after quite a few centuries, 1000 years or something like this, it's not 
a, def a defined cycle, but it it must be a very long time because from the beginning of the dwarves to um, the fourth age, there are only seven Durins and you have thousands of years, more than 7,000 years. So it would make sense if you place them equally that they are usually 1,000 years or something in this um, order between each Durin. And then after these thousand years, a Durin is born that is so similar in looks and maybe behavior that he becomes the next Durin. And he is then considered the reincarnation of Durin. And if, if he is a re reincarnation of him, that would be really strange because how can, like, he should be dead for him to reincarnate, if that makes any sense. So as a result, I really find this decision to put two Durins in succession into Moria. That makes, in my opinion, very, very little sense. It's one of the things that um, I'm really curious what the explanation is. Like, it's really strange. It makes no sense just um, as a hint. Let's move on further. Here we see Galadriel, and I talked previously about that this might be um, the so-called Battle of Sudden Flame, because we see Galadriel, she's covered in ashes, everything is red and burning, kind of, in the background. And... Yeah, that gave me like, okay, this might, she doesn't look happy either. This must be like a terrible moment in her life. And the um, Battle of Sudden Flame, the Dagor Bragolach, as it's called in Elvish, is such um, an event. And it happened in the first age. We mentioned it at the beginning of the video and two of Galadriel's brothers died there. However, now we see like um, a shot of the area. And there's also a person here standing in the background. And for, I would suggest that this doesn't really look like a first age place. Like this looks like a village we have maybe also seen already in the second age to, in some shape or form. But why is it so red and everything's like, the color of this seems so almost unnatural, like so unusual. And I have an idea later in the, in the video, we have an interesting scene as well. I'll try to find it, this one here. And here we see this village. Maybe it is exactly this village. And we discuss this screenshot again, who we see on the picture in a moment. But what we see here is that some kind of shock wave or heavy wind is suddenly appearing here. So let's play it. You see it like this. It's a really, really short clip. That's just a few moments. And if you combine fire and wind, in my mind, I come up with a dragon. And maybe there will be a dragon in the show, which is also not a topic of the second age. So, yeah. And maybe it's exactly this place. It's, it's very hard to tell, but that's just my theory what we might see. Also, look at Galadriel's sword. That is, in my opinion, kind of important because she will switch swords to what we have seen in previous trailers. In the previous trailer, maybe I can edit, edit this in post-production, uh, we see her having a very specific sword design that I identify, uh, where I said, okay, this might be the Nol the, the sword design of the of the Noldor, um, one of the elven clans. And this sword here then its design changes, and maybe this is an indicator for when this plays. If it would be first age, I would expect the other sword design and not this one. I think this is more um a sword design she has during the timeline of the series. So in the second age. We also see how she potentially gets this sword in this trailer, which we might discuss also at a moment. Now we come to another complicated scene. Also interesting to discuss. We talked about the first age and the fall of Morgos. And Morgos had multiple fortresses. One of his fortresses, the first one, was called Utumno also known as Udun, and we know this word Udun from the Lord of the Rings, from the bridge of Khazad-dûm, where Gandalf says to the Balrog, flame of Udun, I think, and yeah, that is the first fortress, and was destroyed very early, and it's very far in the north. Actually, both of his fortresses are in the north. But this one is, yeah, I, if I were to guess how it looks there, Somewhat, it looks cold, potentially it's cold. And we have seen Galadriel wandering through snow in previous um, trailer and teasers, also where we saw her specific sword. 
and she also has some companions. And there's one scene where we see them going through this icy snow area and they are hugging each other and holding up torches. And I assume these little dots here we see down here, these very <laughs> few pixels, these are the torches and they are going towards this place here. Now with the lightning in the background and so on, in this scene we also see lightning in the background and um, that is kind of similar here, like look at this. Some lightning going uh, on uh, somewhere here. Sadly, um, yeah, here's another one. So um, there's definitely something happening there. My theory for this place is though that this is one of her destinations of this um, snow expedition she has with these companions and to go here and explore it for reasons. Where this is, some suggested it's Karn Doom, which is the fortress of the Witch King in Angmar, but that is only there in the um, Third Age. That's Angmar is founded in the Third Age, it's not a Second Age thing. If we assume that Amazon won't include Third Age material into their Second Age show, then this can't be Karn Doom. Another possibility would be Morgoth's second fortress, Angband, and for that he created artificially three volcanic mountains in front of it, or they became part of this fortress, which was, I assume, mostly underground. And these mountains became known as Thangorodrim and in some illustrations they are very like very steep and almost like towers as we see it here in this um, depiction. So maybe it's them and they are also mentioned in the Lord of the Rings so they could maybe use them. Very interesting where this is. I'm very curious and I look forward to finding that out when the uh, series launches but that, these are my theories what this might be. Thangoro Dream though has one big problem and that is not mentioned in, really in the Lord of the Rings that where it once was we talked about Beleriand and it being sunk into the ocean also Thangoro Dream and Angband were sunk into the ocean. It is even possible that Udun also sunk into the ocean because parts of Middle Earth were just removed <laughs> into, into the sea. Maybe it could be Udun, maybe it's also just like a watch like an outpost or a watchtower of one of the old fortresses that somewhere survived in the north in the mountains or so, who knows. Maybe an old hiding place of, uh, of Sauron. I also don't think this is Mordor because um, Mordor is like, you see these little particles here, it looks like snow and the other stuff we have seen so far, it looks cold and Mordor is like with, with the ashes and so on, it would look different in my opinion. Maybe though I also thought the idea of this may be being like the, the, the beginning of constructing Baradur it might be an interesting idea but um, yeah I, I don't think so. Also we see two objects or structures or maybe they are just stones there in the snow. Also very interesting though I can't tell you what it is. Maybe ruins of once a powerful wall or something or Maybe th these were towers once, pretty hard to tell. If this would be Angband, I'm not sure if they would may try, try to include a reference to Ankalagon. That would be pretty cool though. Let's move on further and here we mentioned the symbol and I already um, showed it I think in post-production that was on the dead body of Finrod and yeah here we see the symbol again. I don't know who this person here is. We know of another potential evil character called Adar which translates to father, maybe it's him, maybe it's one of the dwarves because I don't know or it's um, one of the elves, like I can't, maybe it's Galadriel but like in this shot the hair looks a bit brighter but I wouldn't say it's it's blonde so pro it's, I, I'm very sure it's not her but I could be wrong again, hard to tell but somebody who has long hair and interestingly not that many characters in the show have long hair. We only have Galadriel and Adar. Also Gil-galad and some of the female characters like Bronwyn. Also Halbrand has long hair and Isildur as well. And if I'm not completely mistaken at least when it comes to this length shown here that's pretty much it right? Maybe one of the priestresses or that we have seen, I don't know. But this symbol here I would definitely connect to Sauron because it is on the body of Finrod and Finrod was killed by Sauron. So um, let us move further and now we see another new character that's not in the books. His name is Theo and you can interpret it Old English. So 
it, it must not be Greek, which would be not really fitting. But Old English would be, you could argue, would fit. And we see this man grabbing his arm and it's shot in a way. Same with, um, by the way, the priest wrist, where you never see the ears really well. And here in this shot, you never see the arm, but you see there's a wound here or something on his arm. He looks at it and this man grabs him and he asks him, have you heard of him, lad? Have you heard about Sauron? Or something like that. And here you see it's again covered by the leg. You don't see the uh, wound. And only in one frame, which is somewhat hard to hit, this one here, you see the wound. And this wound is very reminiscent of um, the pommel of a sword. Like on the character poster of Theo, you see him holding this weird, evil-looking, broken black sword. And that is, maybe I can find it really quick, this one here. And this here, like, I'm not 100% sure if it fits. I'm not sure if it's it's six. It's six of those little spiky things. Uh, we only see five. But maybe I can't count. Or maybe one isn't as is deep enough. But my imagination is he finds the sword and this wound has to do with the sword. I don't really know exactly if that might be the case or not. But um, yeah, it's an interesting scene. It's also well cut here because he he also goes a bit backwards while um, freeing his arm from the grab of this man, which also looks a bit like he's one of the fellas from the prancing pony from Peter Jackson, to be honest. <laughs> really like him, how he looks. Also, I think um, um, the boy plays um, this scene really well. Like, he looks really like this look. I really like it. Good job. And then she also goes a bit back and they um, edited this well together. And she's hiding somewhere, it seems, maybe in a closet or like a little um, room or something. I don't know. And yeah, also the door is moving. Maybe she just closed it really fast and hope she's not found. And then we have this claw coming out of the ground. And then we see this door. Maybe she's hiding behind that. And we see also... Um, marks of a claw already in the stone. It might be an accident, but um, maybe there was already going a fight going on before. It looks definitely that, like um, stuff happened there. And, and it probably also looks like this building has seen better times. And this person only has one ear, it seems. I would interpret it as kind of orcish, like an orc or something. Maybe I'm wrong though. And this shot really reminds me of, uh, maybe you know Nosferatu, the film from 1920 when, uh, 1921, directed by Mr. Murnau, who um, is from Germany, interestingly, and migrated to the United States, I think. But yeah, really fantastic film. One, probably one or the first um, spooky or horror film in, in some way. And has some really iconic shot you have seen a million times, copied from that, or reference, to be um, precise. And this shot here is another one of those, I feel. Especially this shot where you see the claw, like in the um, Nosferatu film, you usually sh see the shadow um, of the of his claw. What's also interesting, you see some hairs here. Like you see this, there's a little, let me just see if I can capture it a bit better. Like that might be a hair down here and here. So maybe he already hit somebody with his claw and just cut off some hair or so. And that's why there's still hair um, on the claws. If that would be the case, um, that would be pretty neat detail if they um, go for this. Like just from a filming perspective, I would say, wow, that's that's pretty cool. His claw also looks kind of strange, I have to admit. But also his leg looks kind of from the texture, if that makes sense, kind of orcish. Really strange. Like the claws don't look too orcish, to be honest, because usually the orcs have like normal fingers. But not, not sure what's going on here. So maybe it's a special orc. I don't know. It's kind of scary and um, spooky is probably the better. I'm not, not sure what the correct term is, but you know what I mean. And yeah, another bad guy also. And here we see Theo with a mentioned um, broken sword. And on the sword, there's also the rune of, um, let's call it the rune of Sauron. I'm not sure if it is Sauron's rune, but this specific rune we also see on Finrod's body. I uh, will show you the, I already showed you the character poster of him. You see the rune on it as well. And he looks at it, and we, from an interview from the com uh, from Comic Con, we know he finds this sword in a barn, and yeah, he picks it up, and then some force emits from it, 
which is, um, yeah, again, we have the supernatural element. And then in the next scene, here we see this little, um, yeah, what do you call the pommel of the sword on, at the, the bottom of the hilt? Kind of um, interesting. I think still think this has to do with his wound. How he got this wound from the thing, I don't know. Maybe he has to, I don't know, punch it into his arm so it feasts from his life energy and then it becomes activated or powered up or I don't know. And this scene, um, this scene somewhat gave me an idea of what this sword might be. Because if you look at this, there's like smoke coming at the sword. He's, it's absorbing it and we see a bit of fire. Um, yeah, it, it's in this regard interesting that it does this. And there's a description of a specific weapon from the third age, the Morgul blade or Morgul knife. And what Tolkien describes it that after Frodo was struck with it, that is the blade the Nazgul hit Frodo with, appears uh, and pierced um, almost his heart. And what it says there is that the the blade of it started to melt and vanished like a smoke in the air, leaving only the hilt in Strider's hand. And we basically see exactly this just inverted. So I assume this is maybe some early version, like a prototype of the Morgul blade. And for whatever reason it was found in this barn, I don't know, maybe there's a story behind that. But that would be my theory for this. Some speculate this might be Gorthang, which translates to Iron of Death, that is the Sword of Turin, which is, we discussed this in the last video, it's forged by um, the Dark Elf Eol out of meteorite and he forged two swords um, of it and one of the f swords, um, Anglachel, was later reforged into Gorthang and it's a legendary sword and, and then it um, shattered later. So some speculate it might be this, but in my opinion that is also not a second age topic, but it, the implication of this sword in the law, at least in some versions Tolkien wrote, are so big that this weapon is far too powerful to be like in, in the rings of power show. Like I, I don't see that. So I would say maybe it's a Morgul, a proto Morgul blade. This also looks a bit like um, the, um, the Towers of Teeth in, um, in the, at the Black Gate of Mordor. It looks a bit like um, one of those parts of it. Kind of interesting. But yeah, the rune definitely seems to be um, related to Morgoth, uh, to Sauron. And here is also a person standing. And yeah, this person has like, like the clothes looked a bit, like maybe they have seen better times. And the person has a belt or something. If you look at this, it's really hard to see. And a knife. We also saw some, I don't know, um, what is it called? Um, candle wax here, I, I assume, on the table. But there are little details in this scene that still um, quite confuse me. Maybe it's also an orc threatening Theo or so, but it doesn't look really threatening, to be honest. Maybe it's one of the priestresses, but they look too different from that here, so I don't think so. What's also interesting, if you cut this smoke here to um, the priestress we have seen, it looks like this. Look at this. I see the smoke is very, very similar in, in a way. It could be just an accident, but it was definitely a thought I got when I saw the sword here. So quite interesting. Um, yeah, so let's move on because <laughs> we are very late. Then we have this scene here, which is inside this structure, which might be one of Morgoth's old fortresses, it has this look that some parts of it look like a natural cave or something, but it also looks kind of made, like it's a mixture, mixture of both. Here we see maybe bricks or so that would hint at this and these columns here. They, they feel a bit like, okay, this was made by somebody. And the landscape outside also um, has lightning again. And it's kind of fitting to what we have seen before. My, Scene wise. So I assume they just entered through this main gate here and are now in some very big hallway of this structure. And we see only six companions. In this early scene, I think we see nine. So three are lost or waiting outside or securing or I don't know. I assume this here in the middle is Galadriel. And 
yeah, quite, and we see again the symbol of Sauron on this anvil, or maybe it's an altar, I can't tell you, but it's interesting that we see this symbol here um, again. Very interesting. So that's also why I assume Galadriel, we know from some texts, is basically chasing or hunting down the people responsible for, like the enemy and the people responsible for the death of her brother. And that in that case, that would be Sauron. So she going here and finding a symbol of Sauron might be like a hint. Okay, we he was here. Let's find some clues where he maybe went next and maybe they try to track him to find um, out what what he what his plan is, where he's going and so on. Definitely a possibility. However, um, yeah, this person I said um, I said in the um, Gilgalad ceremony screen. Remember this person, and he looks very very similar to um, this one person there sitting in the ceremony. So I assume. These other people here also might be the companions. I always thought this is like an arrow and this is a bow, but no, it's a sword and he just holds it. And the next scene, it's also a very interesting one. Um, we see the torch, maybe they heard something in a corner and um, they throw a, a torch there. And suddenly out of nowhere, this um, block of ice lands here and it's, yeah, who, who throws it is maybe the good question. We know that they fight an ice troll and I think the ice troll throws it. I have very good evidence for this if you just brighten up this picture by quite a lot and it looks not so pleasant anymore. But you can see an arm here. It's really hard to see though. But you, you definitely see something moving here. So I assume that is the arm of the troll. You also see something moving down here like a foot or so. So I think that's a that's definitely the ice troll. I wouldn't would be surprised if it's uh, not like that. Now let's um, turn it up. You can even slightly see see an arm here throwing this in the background. Something's also in the ice block. Maybe some stones frozen into it. I don't know. And also, if you look here at the floor, it also looks man-made again. Like it looks like tiles. Could be natural, but it also kind of looks not natural they get kind of hit by it. Probably they are not a fan of that. But um, yeah, that is the ice part. And then we have probably some fighting with the ice troll. We saw also um, this one scene where Galadriel fights. He also, interestingly, I think he lets go of his sword. See, he, um, he definitely um, loses his weapon here and his torch. Kind of interesting what to see if you go frame by frame. Next scene, um, let's leave the icy area and we see a ship burning. Actually three ships on this image. We see this one here, this one here and one's in the background. I originally thought this ship here in the foreground is exploding. But if you go a bit of, uh, back a few frames, you see here there's a ship burning in the background. You see the sails here and the explosion comes from that ship behind um, that, else this part here would have blown off of this burning ship in the foreground. I'm sure who these persons are. One of them might be Galadriel. This one here maybe-ish. Maybe not, could be wrong. And the armors here we also see in another scene. Um, it's definitely Numinor. And also here you see this arc of this bridge here and there's a sun symbol on it, I assume. Same, same here. Probably hard to see. Maybe you can zoom it in in post-production better. Yeah, the structures and the architecture looks like this. Why these ships are burning, I don't know. There were burning ships in the first age, not in the second though. So I don't know what's going on there exactly. So let's move on further. Here we see Bronwyn um, holding her th son Theo. And he's not the son of Arondia, I assume. But I could be wrong there. And some assume that this here is like a cut, but if you look carefully, you see this cut is gone, gone here in this scene. So it's, it's I assume it's uh, her head also moves. Like in this scene, you see it a bit like how it moves. Like the cut wouldn't move like this if he just turns her face slightly. And yeah, this is uh, Bronwyn and not much to say here, I assume. She's kind of happy to see him. The background looks like maybe um, this um, stone ruined place from the a second teaser we we'll maybe discuss in a moment and yeah we talked about there are not enough bad guys in the teasers um for example i was invited 
to the um, analysis stream of the German Tolkien Society, which was a lot of fun. And there um, somebody said um, that there are not enough bad guys when we discussed the previous main teaser. And now here's another one. So this teaser is far more bad guy centered almost. And this is potentially Adar. He has like this claw here. There's also a character poster that was the rumor that was him. I think his name is not officially revealed, but it might be that. And his other hand has no gauntlet. Like it's not, you see the difference here, which is kind of interesting. His name Adar means father in uh, translated. And we see these orcs here. I assume they are orcs in the background. We also see this ceiling here again. We have seen this other scene where I said, okay, this is uh, Arondir gets captured and brought to like an orc prison camp or something or mining camp. And I'm pretty sure it's this one here. They also have these pretty cool um, bone things on their head and so on. And yeah, if you look at sound like this face here definitely looks really like an orc. Like we have seen Adar on a character in a new character poster with her with his face and he also has unusual sword that is very reminiscent of the sword um, that I said were Numenorean swords. Some assume he might be um, related to the sons of Feanor because there was also one scene where we see these people like taking an oath, like the oath of Feanor. Many assume that this scene is. And some assume he might be one of the sons of Feanor and there's in, in the Silmarillion, one son seems to survive, and that is Maglor, which is a foster father of Elrond, interestingly. And some assume this might be him. However, in, I, I think it's letter 131, Tolkien um, gives a summary. It's like from 1951, if I remember correctly. Tolkien men gives a summary of some of the events of the First Age surrounding these powerful gems of Feanor, the Silmarilli. And there he writes that both of them died, like one cast himself into the sea and the other into the fire. So that is as Tolkien assumes that both of them are dead. As a result, I would argue it can't be Maglor and I also don't like using a mythological figure. Like the idea is he has a Silmaril, it burns his hand, he can't keep it and he's in despair because he did terrible, terrible things to get this gem. And then he has to to fulfill his oath and then he has to throw it into the water into the sea out of this and then he wanders the coastline of middle earth in despair forever and um that has such a dramatic mythological feeling to it that i would find it very very fan fiction like if we would say what if maglor would um, be very angry at uh, Sauron and want to and, and Morgoth and want to get revenge and comes back and then he allies with the orcs like Maglor I think would not really ally with orcs like there might especially in a way can, can you could you argue he has fulfilled his oath he kind of has not but also in a way he has like the oath said you've you got this at least two Silmarilli one you couldn't get because it's out of reach for for elves and men completely and you got this you got two of them at least and then you find out you can't possess them they they reject you in a way they burn your hand because you are evil now in my opinion though it would be again not a fitting topic for the second age it feels for me personally a bit too fan fiction like though i can I can get the argument if you just go with a Silmarillion version, which they don't have the rights to. But um, yeah, it, it would feel strange. And as said, there's letter 131, if I remember correctly, where he's potentially dead as well. So there's that. So I, I don't, I hope they don't go this th this route. I could, he could be like in the service of one of the sons of Feanor, of Maglor or so, and so on. And he survived all of the, of the madness um, these sons and Feanor did and now he, I don't know, seeks some kind of revenge or his own agenda, really hard to tell. But according to the um, leak so far, Adar is like an elf, a corrupted elf and yeah, he runs around in this, with his gauntlet and this black armor. Very curious what's going on with, with him. The next scene, we I said previously I will talk about it again, so very briefly we see the Numenorians 
placing this banner on the ground. And I think on the banner, we might see this particular thing here just in a diminished form, if that makes sense. So it has to do with Numinor. We see the shields and on the shields, we have this sun symbol, which is very reminiscent of that. And we see also a new character that is not in the books, that is Halbrand. Some speculate he might be Sauron in disguise. Some speculate he might be later become the Witch King or something like this, or one of the Nazgul. There, some have the feeling that he seems to be like a good character, maybe a bit um, even Aragorn-like or I don't know, um, Eomer-like. And um, he then maybe turn. it would be an interesting plot twist if he turns into a bad guy at some point. Or maybe he has like his own bad agenda that nobody sees coming, something like that. And yeah, it would be of course quite interesting, but it's I guess pure speculation at this point. But we know he's also on this raft with Galadriel. He gets washed ashore and then the Numenorians um, help him out. He gets new clothes and this sword we see him on the character poster and this armor which um, seems to be of Numenorian design, just the color of, of is different. And yeah, the sword is the same though, with the, with the hilt that is shaped like a horse, which I thought would be like a weapon of the Norsemen, um, the ancestors of the Eotheot, but that's not the case, definitely not the case, because we see this sword multiple times. There's also guard behind him. And yeah, definitely Numenor. Here we see um, Arondir and Bronwyn four times. She maybe holds a speech or something here and tries to motivate people. Here with Arondir, we see like a cut in his armor and some shots the cut is missing. So I assume if they done have done everything right, we can maybe somewhat get a chronology of all of this by um, doing this. There's also a person here and he has like, I don't know, maybe also like a little insignia or something with a bow. Hard to tell who that might be. And they are at a ruin. And I assume um, in the second teaser at the beginning, we see the tower where Arondir later stands on and also some ruins surrounding it. I assume that's exactly here. And I assume they get attacked by the orcs and have maybe to defend themselves for whatever reason. Because we also see like a scene in a moment. Here in this scene, I mentioned Galadriel's new sword. And this is exactly the sword. Keep this particular form in mind. What is strange though with this scene, so somebody holds a sword up and these people are running. In the background, we see these banners, which are um, has a sun symbol on it. They are blue and yellowish. And what is very interesting in the background, we see a blonde person in an armor, which is also hard to see, but I assume this is actually Galadriel here. So maybe she gets um, the sword from here. Maybe this person here then is Halbrand from behind or so. Really hard to tell. But yeah, it seems Numenorian symbols and seems the Numenorians with Galadriel come to back to Middle-earth and then they maybe help these people fight or so or try to defend them. It's really strange, I have to admit. But yeah, this sword here seems to become the new sword of Galadriel. We've seen this in this um, red shot where she's covered in ashes as well. We see it in many other shots um, too. Here we I mentioned the Oath of Feanor and that um, Adar might be one of these persons here, which I assume are the sons of Feanor. There are seven sons plus Feanor who take an oath, so-called oath of Feanor. Jenny Dolphin, shout outs to her, made a fantastic artwork of the scene. It's described more reddish than here because, um, yeah, that's mentioned in the Silmarillion, but we only see um, not seven, but only, uh, I think, uh, five persons here. Still, I mean, it makes sense that it's at night because the two trees were destroyed. So there was no light source in Amman anymore. And we only had the stars as light. That's really fitting. But some assume that the sword designs look somewhat similar to what we have uh, seen um, in other screenshots. And as I said, the sword of Adar also looks a bit like this. And some assume maybe some of those men might be him. But in my opinion, that's Definitely a, str a stretch. Then next scene, we see Galadriel holding this particular sword we have seen a moment ago. So that's for me very interesting. It's definitely this sword here. There's no doubt about it. And she gets on a ship. The lightning is really strange. And there are like a lot of filter and other things over the scene. 
she enters the ship. Here in the background we see the sun symbol, so this must be a Numinor in my opinion. The arcs and architecture look very Numinorian as well. And also these soldiers, they, they seem to be the, the, the cavalry soldiers or forces of Numinor, now without horses though. And we see here the horse blade already, that also is on the character post of Halbrand, I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, really, really interesting. This is the design of the Numenorean armor. It looks very Rohan-like. We have later a shot that's very reminiscent. And we also see her dagger. I mentioned it when we saw the, the dead corpse of her brother, Finrod, in this one scene. So um, there's definitely um, yeah so, some interesting details. And she, now she has this armor on. And this here is like a Fenorian star. And um, yeah, we, we um, somebody said in an one of these panels of Comic-Con that this is a gift because Galadriel's relationship to Feanor was not the best. If this is a Feanorian star, it makes no sense. Galadriel hates Feanor and yeah, it's really kind of strange that she has this kind of armor. But maybe it's not the star of Feanor. Like the, the symbolism with the Feanorian stars is really strange, I have to admit. Makes, makes very little sense in my opinion. And here we see her arm with like a chainmail. I don't, maybe it's a mithril chainmail. I'm not sure, but I don't think so though. And here, Halbrand grabs him. This is Halbrand's armor. This now fits perfectly to the character poster. We uh, know it's him. We see him later in this armor. Then in this scene, we see Arondir jumping down from his tower. This is definitely, in my opinion, the tower we see at the beginning. We also see the armor has already this cut here. So it has to be around the time we have seen uh, the other scene where she gives a speech, maybe after that. And now the orcs attack here in the background. We definitely see them here. And what I kind of like is that they, this time, like the, the jump looks very high and hurtful, but he doesn't go for the three-point landing, which I appreciate. Still, um, yeah. He kicks now down this rock here, and there's a chain on the rock. Like, it's hard to see. Let me just see if I make... Here you see the chain. I assume... Like, they prepared for this orc attack and maybe made like a trap mechanism. He kicks it down and then activates it. And then, I don't know, all these stones fall down on these um, other f supporting forces uh, coming up there. And then he has uh, far less people to, um, to kill. They also have like a ram here. We know this from another scene. Maybe they try to open this door and go get to the tower or so, deeper into these ruins. Very hard to see. We also know some of the orcs here from the from the IGN. They published some orc screenshots that they seem to fit um, to those here. That seems very related. We also see in another trailer like um, that they come to over the, like or this narrow past. I assume that's a bridge. If, if we go back to where he jumps down, it's very hard to see. But here you see there's also a body of water, and this might be really the bridge that we see there. So it's perfectly fitting. But um, yeah, let us move on further. Here we see Tarmiriel again, like this time dressed differently. And what is interesting, which I never noticed before, but um, she holds a little child in her arm. And what's going on with that? I have no idea. Tarmiriel had no children to my knowledge. Though um, Farazon, we also see in the series, we already talked about him briefly, her cousin. And he has a child, or he has a son called um, Kemen. And in the books, no son of Farazon is mentioned. So that seems kind of strange, I have to admit. But yeah, I don't know. She doesn't look too happy. So I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on here exactly with this child. I suppose it's not hers. Maybe it's like some ceremony that um, and she's like from the royal line or so. Really hard to tell. There's also this person in the background, but I can't tell you who that might be. Then we also come back to Moria again and we see Disa, the wife of uh, Prince Durin the Fourth, singing. And we know there's like from some leaks that there's like um, a crash of tunnels, like a, coll a collapse of tunnels and she sings like a lemon for them. But also her singing is kind of able to basically resonate with a stone and then tell the tell the dwarves where they have to um, dig for ores and so on. 
kind of interesting. Really looking forward to see all the dwarf stuff here, to be honest. Um, yeah, but seeing Disa, they said she has like sideburns, I think they are called in English. So there is a little bit of beard going on for the dwarven females, but according to the Lord of the Rings, it's hinted at because it said that men and elves can't differentiate um, dwarven females and dwarven men from each other. And in the War of the Jewels, um, there's like an older version of this quote um, of this passage, I assume. And that even says like that dwarves have beards from their beginning, males and females alike. So there's always a beard evolved with dwarves, which is kind of funny. And I really like that because it makes the dwarves so much different compared to all the others. Like it's not like they are the crafty little people, but they also feel actually in the context of fantasy very different from the other people um, with, with some details like these. And I really like that. Then we see um, Durin the Fourth, Prince Durin the Fourth, holding a bit of silver ore, which I assume is Mithril, because the reason behind this is that we we talked briefly about Celebrimbor and Eregion, and Eregion has a very good relationship to Kazadum to Moria, and they he founded his realm cl very close to Moria, like there's even a street going from the capital of Eregion directly to the uh, west gate of Mo uh, of Moria, and he helped them making the west gate. And a reason why they settled there was that the dwarves the found Mithril. I'm not sure when they find it exactly. They could have found it in the first age already, because Casa Doom existed also in the first age. But maybe they find it in the second age and. In one trailer he says um, this is the beginning of a new era, or era, or however it's pronounced, and this um, definitely would make sense to use like as a plot device that they find it, the elves and get try get to bet, get are interested in the material, they a friendship develops, they the elves have interest in this metal because gold has a tendency of evil, as Tolkien describes it in Morgoth's ring, and that is why like silver has it less and that is might be one reason why elves prefer silver material over gold one though they also use gold here and there it's not like that but definitely maybe they're more interested in silver which also maybe represents a starlight a bit better which the elves um culturally really lo love so kind of interesting here we see arondir and bronwyn already we've seen many scenes with with them I already talked about the relationship. Here we see the cavalry of Numinor. Like these are Numinorian soldiers, we have learned this. And here's Galadriel and here's Halbrand, I assume. And I assume they return with a ship we have seen to Middle Earth and then they help there in uh, defeat the bad people. That is my um, idea behind this scene. It's pretty cool to see, but. Like, like I said earlier, if they want to make things so different from the from Peter Jackson, then this shot is just this feels too much like Rohan, and that's a bit unfortunate. Also, it must be mentioned that according to Unfinished Tales, uh, Numenor really loved horses, but they would not use them for war. Only like a person car carrying messages would be maybe lightly armed and be on a horse, of course, but. Um, other than that, they also mention like um, archers on horses, which are not Numenorians, though. They basically some mercenaries they hire to help them out in war. But usually they would um, not use horses in war. That's so it's strange that um, the show goes with this cavalry. I just think it's because of the Rohan reference in some way. So I find that, I mean, it's kind of nice to see, but why, ex why the Numenorians? Like, it's... It feels a bit unusual, I have to admit. And here we see her throwing her sword, and this is not the same scene because here we see not we see a building in the background. Maybe they reach this village that we have um, discussed before that might burn later or not. And yeah, Galadriel, uh, John Dark style, is um, going to combat. Here we see another interesting scene. We see orcs running through um, a forest, and my theory is. There's another scene from the very first teaser where we see Arondir in a forest and he grabs an arrow out of the air and shoots it back at his enemies. We don't see them having bows here, I think. Maybe I'm wrong though. 
But maybe it's related to this scene. Maybe they flee from this prison camp because in this scene Arondia also wears no armor like in the prison camp. And maybe they manage to flee with some prisoners and he saves his mate from um, from the arrow. And they're on their way um, to the forest and get chased by the orcs. Definitely a possibility. Also we talked about the texture of the lag in this Nosferatu scene. Like here you see it, what I mean. Like this is a bit similar to... And this dude here. So quite interesting. Next scene again we see Galadriel swimming and like a sea monster, huge tail of a sea monster in the background. Maybe they get attacked by that or so. Well they definitely get attacked in this scene and there are some people on the raft. And there's one scene where there are multiple rafts and multiple people on rafts um, in this tank stuff where they filmed this. And yeah that's kind of interesting. First I assume this might be Halbrand. But uh, maybe it's not him, it's somebody else and he just gets crushed by this powerful tail. Sea monsters, as said, um, there are very little sea monsters in the service of Sauron. There's only, um, I think he's called the Watcher in English. He kind of tries to get Frodo and it's assumed that he might be in some contact with Sauron, which is unusual, but it seems also some sea units exist or swimming units exist. Here, um, though in the ocean, I would say that's usually territory of the of the high angel of the sea, basically like um, Poseidon or Neptune, and um, he's called Ulmo in Tolkien's world, Valar, the lord, one of the Valar and Valar and lord of the waters. And yeah, he maybe doesn't want that they reach Aman, and so that's why they get attacked, and then they land in Numinor in some way. It's really strange to me. But definitely some problems um, <laughs> occur here. It could also be like one of the angels taking the form of like a sea monster like Osse. I don't think it's his um, his uh, wife Uinen, but maybe it's Osse. Osse is also the one who brings up n like the, the, the landmass of Numinor, the island, up from down from the sea to the surface. So he's like a, really a force of nature, you could say. Very interesting. Um, to see but yeah the context of that is hard to tell it looks pretty cool like effect wise they put into a lot of effort there was a gigantic tank these actors had to swim through and so on very interesting but we also we definitely see that the boat gets hit we see like the particles of it and also like here uh, we see some flying through the air pretty cool as a side note, there is a poem about a sea monster published in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which is a poem collection Tolkien made under, let's say, somewhat special circumstances. The idea behind it is a bit um, that hobbits write about their folklore in poem form. Also there's one poem about the man in the moon and he comes down on earth like a meteor. And interestingly, these books are part of the Red Book of Westmarch. Next scene would be, yeah, back to Numinor. Here we see Halbrand and we see these horse hills with the horse hat on it. And everyone has them. So I assume Halbrand gets his one, uh, his sword here too. And we also see Tarmiriel here on her horse. And we see these banners, which are also very reminiscent of the banners we see in this one scene where somebody holds up the sword of um, Galadriel, I assume. We look at this banner, it's so reminiscent of Numinor, I have to admit. So oh, I skipped too far ahead. Yeah, but it could be one of these. There's also a person looking out of this window, which is a detail I really love. Like, I like sm love small details like this. this. This window could also be closed and nobody there, but this gives it like this extra little bit of life. Really love the set design here. Pretty cool. Also, flowers are um, falling down here, probably due to medial. And we also see in the next shot the flowers on the ground. This seems also pretty cool. There's not much else to say here, I think. This is probably, they're probably leaving to go to Middle-earth. This scene here I also really like. We see now finally the dwarf guards close up and we see their mask, which looks pretty interesting. And it's mentioned in the Silmarillion that the dwarves of Belegost, I think, um, in a fight also used masked, uh, masks and they 
protected them against the fire of dragons and so on. Also, the beard for dwarves is very important. Like, we can read that if a dwarf loses um, his beard, it can kill him out of shame. And um, he would suffer many, many wounds and hurts that would kill elves and men, but not a dwarf. But if it's if his beard would be gone, it would be more deadly than any of those wounds. That's how Tolkien describes it. So it makes sense that they protect um, their beards. But I really like this scene. Like It looks really cool and he just moves up his arm and everyone just stops and think, oh no, some, what is going on here? Like it, has, like it feels like there's a lot of authority here going on. And there's also like a mug and he also like f- his fist bumping if that makes sense like look at look at his arm movement and then he just stops too so maybe there was like like they were celebrating something or maybe dwarves always have their mugs and drinking um i don't know whatever kind of a really interesting scene very curious to see but i really love this scene it's one of my favorites the color here of his now he has also this cape and we don't see the color but there would stand durin deathless on it in kirs then we see the stranger. We discussed him quite a lot in previous um, sections already. Yeah, that is always complicated to discuss. Like, this scene looks very supernatural and he holds like the hand of this little um, proto-hobbit. This is definitely um, Nori. And she looks very young here in this shot. But I really like the size difference uh, difference already. And yeah, I don't know. Very interesting in my opinion and yeah we have seen her seeing the meteor and it lands somewhere and she goes probably to where the meteor landed and then this man comes out of it and grabs her that's how i understand this scene here and the problem is in the previous trailer he also absorbs the fire of that um, of that meteor and also seems to not hurt him so as a result he must be a very powerful being and the only beings powerful enough for that are for example, the Maya. So I would assume he's one of the Maya and that makes no sense for the second age because then he could be one of the Istari, for example. The problem is the Istari come in the third a- come to Middle-earth in the third age. And there's one version where the blue wizards would come to Middle-earth in the second age. But this is only in peoples of Middle-earth and I don't think they have the rights for that. Like in the Lord of the Rings, the blue wizards aren't even mentioned. They're only mentioned in a letter, in the Unfinished Tales, and in Peoples of Middle-earth. And maybe in Nature of Middle-earth in one particular weird context. But that's that's everything we have. And they have the rights to none of them as far as we know. So it seems strange that they would implement like a wizard into the Second Age. And the wizards of the Second Age, the blue wizards, are also going on a mission into the very far east. So relatively far away from all the locations we have seen so far, though we don't know where the hobbits live exactly, but I would assume they go even further into the east than uh, Mirkwood. So that that seems so strange to me. In addition, there's also only one version where they come to Middle-earth in the Second Age, and I assume they don't have the rights for that. And of course, it would also be very powerful. It feels like also again, okay, like in Lord of the Rings, we need like a wizard who's wise or so, maybe a bit strange and funny. Maybe something like, like maybe he's a mixture between Radagast and Gandalf from The Hobbit. I don't know. It seems strange though that we see a supernatural being. Another possibility would be he's like not one of the East study who comes to Middle-earth. He is actually, let's say, Sauron in disguise. In a good possibility, we know that Sauron disguises himself in the Second Age, takes the form, but not like of, of a wizard. And it's not clear if he knows about the Hobbits. Some some argue there might be some hints in the Lord of the Rings that he knew about the Hobbits already, but I don't know. It, it's strange. I could imagine, though, that they make him appear the good guy, nobody sees it coming, and then at the end it turns out he's Sauron. He also, like in this one scene where he absorbs a fire, it looks like a fiery eye. So that's definitely an interesting detail. Though I would have definitely imagined this different. There's another hint though in this video that also might indicate at this person being a wizard. It also seems like he lost like some of his memory or so. Really strange. I'm not a hugest fan of the um, so-called meteor or meteorite man. I have to admit. 
because as said, if they want to make a show about wizards and I don't know what, then make a third age show, not a second age show. Like, I don't fully understand that. Next scene, we see Arondir flying Legolas style towards an orc. We know that is an orc from the next scene, the this this um, piece of garment here that he has, this cape or whatever it is, looks very um, similar to something we see um, in, in another scene. Maybe it comes right next. This one here and this one here. This is what I mean. This is clearly an orc and he has a lot of fun currently. Like, he really likes what he's seeing. And that worries me, to be honest. But yeah, he flies and we see a walk here in the background and he has like a chain through his uh, mouth. So I think he is now trying to break free and is fighting the orcs and so on. He has like also like a tool or maybe a twig that's, um, or something like this. And he also has this guy helping him and he also is fighting, it seems. Also very interesting, we see maybe um, sulfur, whatever it is, like these green, uh, this green, this yellow stuff in the background, there's even like a yellow cloud. So maybe this prison camp mines sulfur or something. That would be, we see this in multiple scenes, by the way. The walk is here, we see, have seen the, him dodging this walk in another scene, so I assume and he's now stuck maybe here. So I assume something like this, um, these scenes are somehow connected. And he probably kills this man. Here we see the stranger again, the meteorite man. And yeah, in this scene I stopped it perfectly. This is why I maybe think he's a wizard. Do you see this object he's holding here? Maybe smashes in the, on the ground in a moment? It looks like a wizard hat. Like, look at the shape of it. This is like the tip of it. Oh, I was too fast. See here, you see how pointy it is here at the end? Here you see it as well. And here you see the, the shape. If you would put it on his head, it would be really like a wizard head, like Gandalf head. And I'm not the hugest fan of that. Like I said, the wizards are not a topic of the second age. So it seems they're not appearing in the books or so. Really strange. And there are the hobbits in the background and they don't see like seem like scared, more like curious. What is he doing there? So that's a bit strange, but they don't feel like they are in panic that they, that they fear what this man is doing. They kind of trust him. And then we see here when he hits it on the ground, like a sh little shock wave even appears. That seems very supernatural, I have to admit. Like I get the dust um, is also a bit heavy, I guess, but the shock wave is really, really weird. So this clearly seems very supernatural. And yeah, here we see the mentioned sulfur or yellow stuff again here in the background. And this is maybe a pit, pit, maybe a fighting pit or so. We see an orc down here and he's looking forward. He's not a fan of getting thrown down there by the by the orcs. And there's also like, I don't know, something dead or another orc here. There's a dead orc here, a dead prisoner. These prisoners are hiding. There's another orc. And we see the, the chain in this scene as well. So very interesting um, details that we see here. This year we have talked about he awakes maybe and we see smoke coming up here. And he, he has too much, he looks too evil and has too much fun. So whatever it is, maybe somebody gets like, I'm not sure what it's called, like branding or whatever you call it. Something like that I could imagine. Because he has just far too much fun what he sees then. It, it's not in a good way for from my perspective. Also, the blade here, like he has two ears though, but we have seen the um, scene with the sword that the blade is reconstructed by itself out of smoke and fire. And we see like a very pointy blade like this here. So maybe that is um, another hint at the person holding it being an orc. And here we see the scene where we see the shock wave. And I said, maybe it's a dragon because maybe it's this village. What is interesting, there are arrows sticking in this roof here. Very interesting, uh, unusual detail. And yeah, we also see a lot of interesting people here. First of all, we see uh, maybe this is Tarmiriel, I'm not sure. We see Arondir and here we see Bronwyn. And here also we see like Numenorians, and this Numenorian holds um, like a scepter with a sun symbol. So these are definitely the Numenorians. Like a, there's a meeting of a lot of um, all kinds of people here in this uh, scene. Very interesting. Not sure what's going on exactly, but there's like a shockwave or a storm coming and they fear what, what's coming. 
Definitely. The arrows also seem kind of strange. But yeah, maybe they get surprised and now the fire comes um, later or so. Really, really hard to tell what's going on there exactly. But maybe it really is like a dragon or so. Next scene, yeah, we see Galadriel. Here we see a scene that might, we see the sword again. And this scene might be related to the Vanity Fair screenshot where we see an armor and like an explosion of fire in the background. She walks and also mentioned like war um, in the northern or I don't know, wherever east and northern regions. And maybe she has a vision here and that is what she, uh, the fiery part we see is maybe what um, what she is seeing in her vision because Galadriel as Elrond and for example Círdan had the gift of foresight. So quite interesting. In the next scene we already discussed this luckily. Here if you zoom in quite a lot you see like a little triangle and maybe a tail, so something like a dragon tail or so. Really hard to tell what's going on on the amulets or so. Here I really can't see what we see here on this um, thing at the side. But yeah, it, it would be very interesting um, to find out more about that. I think if I make it a bit brighter, you can't really um, see it here, what it might be. I can, of course, increase. Well, we can actually see it better than I anticipated, to be honest. But yeah, we don't really see a symbol here. You only see these lines. And I, th I assume the most important part of this here is... Uh, here inside and here it gets too dark to see it so very unfortunate I would have loved to show you what this means and she blows like the smoke and the sparks away from her with her breath and maybe that is related to the sword of Theon or uh, of Theo not Theon and how to tell also there's a person standing here next but might be one of the other of her assistants I'm not sure her servants Difficult to tell. Very curious what this means. And then now we come to one of the last scenes. Some assume these scenes are connected. I don't think so. My theory here is we are somewhere close to Casa Doom and some unexplored um, tunnels and caves under the earth. And somehow this leaf here managed to find its way all the way down here, like in a very in kind of accident. We see Mithril here. So the dwarves maybe come here at some point and um, dig their ore and it falls deeper and deeper. We have like another cut and it goes deeper and deeper. And then we see um, this scene here. And what is very unusual is that um, we see the, we see like some, some object in the background that starts smoking and we see this burning. And what I think what it, what this means is that in this scene, it lands on the Balrog, on Durin's bane, deep, very deep in the caverns and uh, caves deep under the earth, by accident and just hints at him being there. If we see, look at the at this thing, we also notice that the ground is moving a bit. Like here, so you see that it's a little bit moving. I think it's not just camera movement. Even the initial thing here, like. Like this movement here, you see this? Very strange. And then, um, yeah, this maybe I can also make a bit brighter so you can see it a bit better. You see this object here in the background. It's I don't know what it is supposed to be, but it starts smoking. Now, unfortunately, I just um, undid it by accident. But yeah, it starts smoking. No idea what this exactly means. But um, it definitely seems to be the Balrog. Okay? It's my theory. And then we see Arondi, and he doesn't have the huge cut on his armor. So this must be earlier than the other shots we have seen. We see these creepy hands here in the background, maybe orc hands. Very similar to the hands we have seen um, in the Nosferatu shot, maybe. And they grab him from behind and just pull him away. I have the German teaser trailer here. Very interesting. And cut. And then there's one final scene here at the very end. I already spoiled it. And we see a Balrog. And also the Balrog is not a topic of the Second Age. Balrogs are also um, 
uh, Maiar, so like Sauron, and they were also in the service of Morgoth. Their leader was called Gothmog, and uh, he died in the first age. So this, if maybe this is a, is like a flashback, and this is Gothmog or something. I don't know. Maybe it's a foreshadowing of Durin's Bane. But yeah, Durin's Bane sleeps in the second age, and he only awakes two thousand years into the third age. And then he kills Durin the Sixth. We talked about the reincarnation of the dwarves. So Durin the Third and Fourth have nothing to do with Durin Spain. Durin the Sixth, uh, the Sixth, is the one that gets slain by the Balrog and his son Nuin the First. Also, I think mentioned that by accident. And he looks pretty cool, I have to admit. But still, shout out to the people of Peter Jackson's team who made the Balrog in twenty something years ago because it still looks so good. I would even say in the close-up shot of the Balrog it looks better than this one here in my opinion or at least as good. Like, it's really impressive and um, what they did here. And yeah also I like the heat flickering here that was all already in Peter Jackson's Balrog also had like heat flickering coming out of his mouth. As a result he again seems so similar to what Peter Jackson once did. And if they want to make stuff different, why do they reference and use so many elements and also design ideas? Like, he looks like a Balrog. He could have went for a completely different Balrog design because they are described as um, shaped like men-shaped, I think is what Tolkien um, describes them, but taller. In early versions, they also have a helmet. And in early versions, there were also a lot of Balrogs. And they were less powerful, and then Tolkien changed it to very few Balrogs, and every Balrog is as powerful as an army. So he definitely um, changed these ancient, this terror of ancient terrors of ancient times. Very powerful beings. They also seem to have like something attached here. If you look up here, I'm not sure what if these are supposed to be wings. If Balrogs have wings, is definitely. Um, yeah, a debatable, very debatable topic, I have to admit. There's like a description that they spread their shadow like wings, but it doesn't mean they have wings. But I don't want to go into this um, a discussion here, I just want to mention it. Still, um, yeah, I find it strange that they go for this design and I did not expect to see a Balrog in the Second Age because there are no mentioned Balrogs in the Second Age. They are of course there, but they do nothing. Like it seems too strange in my opinion to to see a Balrog in the show and they maybe just show it to I don't know he's one of the most iconic enemies in the in the classic Lord of Rings films from Peter Jackson maybe also like an absolute classic um of film history in a way and now they are building on that again I find that very unusual I have to admit and not the hugest fan like it's of course I like seeing a cool Balrog but the problem is always, and this now we come maybe to my opinion of the trailer a bit. Um, I like that we sh that they showed a lot of bad guys, even a Balrog, but it often feels too much like fan fiction for my personal taste. Like there are so many elements, and this where I ask myself, why not make a third age series? I know that they won't get the rights to the Silmarillion, so they can't make a first age series, but they maybe do a third age series, maybe make the time around the War of Angmar, because after the War of Angmar, the Balrog of Durin's Bane awakes, so you could even show them there. Sometimes I feel like I'm the wrong age, like, that is no nothing to do with the second age, it's more third age material, um, in a way. And it seems very strange to me, some of the ideas they show. Also the huge time compression and so on, so... I of course know that it won't be the most faithful adaption. I know that an adaption always have to make some changes to make it work in the medium film or a series. And that is perfectly fine. I would still love to... Like if you have so many interesting topics of the second age, I would still love to maybe explore those further than adding up things that Tolkien has never written. You know what I mean? Like if you... You have to find a balance between your own ideas and let's say the fan fiction and what Tolkien actually wrote. And I hope they can find the balance, but currently I'm a bit worried that they won't do this. And that's this adaption that I only have like cool images and maybe also a nice story, but it's in the end not really, it doesn't feel Tolkien. It feels like if you have seen this show, you know nothing about the second age because in the books, it's comp everything is completely different. 
that's a bit my bit my fear. Still kind of like the trailer and there's a lot to talk about. Like considering how long I'm sitting here already and discussing this, it's definitely a testament that they put in effort in a lot of details which we have discussed, especially the language stuff so far seems for the most part very promising. Of course, there are some debatable things as well, but overall, I'm really impressed with the language elements. For example, also some of the trailer lines rhyme and are in a in a specific um, meter. Yeah, stuff like this is so awesome to see. And we, we discussed like the hairs on this claw and so on. There are the details are there and the people that built the sets and the costumes definitely put in the laugh. And so far, everything looks great. Like the first teaser in parts didn't look so awesome. But then I have to admit over teaser after teaser, it starts to look, started to look better and better. And this so far looks really good. So I'm pretty sure we will see some very awesome um, cinematography and images that will be awesome. And I hope we will get an interesting story to follow, even though it might be not that close to the books. It's not like Amazon made a secret out of this. Like all the trailers, if you know the books quite well, you can definitely find out that they might take some liberties. It might not be the extremely close adaption of Tolkien's text we might would have wanted. But still, there's a possibility for them to invent and create and basically bring to life some amazing characters for the show and tell an interesting story nonetheless. And further, I also want to remind that Peter Jackson also did for his films a lot of changes and a lot of took also some freedoms. He changed some characters completely. And I know some book fans to this day who absolutely hate the films because of that. But still, there are also a lot of fans of them. And this is I always see as an opportunity when a new series comes out that it brings new people in. And here um, I'm very hopeful and just hope that everybody will have a good time. Further in this context, it also seems very strange how the marketing campaign went and also looking at these teasers and trailers we got so far. Like I read Tolkien books almost every day or at least multiple times a week. And for I did this in the past five years continuously because I have a channel that make videos about this topic. And even I have somewhat trouble finding out what they are exactly going for. So as a result, if you don't know the law well and look at these trailers, I've, they must be really confusing. And you watch them and ask yourself, okay, what exactly is happening in the show? And what does it have to do with Lord of the Rings? Why is it called like that? That is, in my opinion, really a big problem. I have to say, I liked the trailers because it was fun discussing them and really pick them apart frame by frame, trying to find what what obscure lore references there might be hidden in them. However, I guess for people who are not that deep into the books, this might be a bit frustrating. You see the trailers and you have no idea what's going on in the show. You don't know who those characters are, what their relationship is. I have to say the the teasers and trailers did a very poor job of communicating the show. Like I would have maybe expected a small story trailer that at least gives us, or it gives at least gives new people some kind of introduction of, okay, that is the second age. You remember maybe, I don't know, the last alliance, the war and so on. It was before that and this is how it's this is how we start into the show. These are maybe the, the first scenes. This is the introduction into this. And I don't know, I, I have to say the marketing campaign is really weird for the Rings of Power. Not a fan of that so far. And this was already um, discussed quite a lot by some other people. Still, um, I made hour long videos just about these uh, teaser trailers. But as I said, it's more fun discussing this. It's an opportunity if you want to look in the books again and see hmm, what could they reference. I like this. This is something I really enjoy doing the research, looking at the at the imagery and finding hidden details that hopefully nobody has found yet and posting about them, translating some of the inscriptions and so on. That's a lot of fun for me. So from this perspective, I have a good time so far. But 
um, still, I'm very curious. So if you are new to the whole Lord of the Rings fandom and books, do you have any, maybe post it in the comments, do you have any idea what the show is about? What is the exact topic there? Because even I have no clue what they will show exactly. I know some stuff because I know what happens in the second age. Very difficult for me to see how people who can't do that understand what's going on. That's very strange. I think though, of course, it's just some teasers and we have like eight hours of um, show, I think, coming out. And I also heard that they will continuously um, increase the length of the show from eight to nine. And then in the last season, the fifth will be like 12 hours um, or so. And overall, it will be 50 hours of um, show um, over five seasons. So that's really impressive. But, and of course, I would also expect that this explains then a lot. But just from the marketing perspective and the teasers, I found this really strange. I can't deny that. Only after listening to 10 interviews with the showrunners and the actors and reading 20 different articles in all kinds of magazines, I slowly start to get an idea what's going on. But just from the trailer footage, <laughs> it's just, in my opinion, almost impossible to piece together what's going on there. It's like, really, a lot of cuts, so many scenes. These, these discussions here, this analysis is so long because... I don't know. There are some scenes that are literally only, I don't know, half a second long. <laughs> it's just ridiculous how, how how many cuts in this trailer are. It's just, it's just full of stuff. Like, so many scenes are there, but all of them are very short, and it feels like they are missing a bit of context. Like, there's no red line that connects the different scenes with each other. Maybe except for the meteor on that one trailer, but the meteor also makes no sense, so it doesn't help. So you really have to sit there and piece it together yourself, which we just did over the past two hours. I also want to apologize, the video is very late and it's also insanely long, but I really had, I struggled making this one here, it took a long time, I couldn't make it shorter, it was really difficult. I'm also not that happy with my performance here and there, of narrating this video. Sorry for that. Probably gets better in the next break uh, down and analysis video. If a new trailer comes out, there will also be a stream. However, all I can say is thank you people for watching. See you next time. Okay, that was very long, so here my very short introduction. I produced the video in 4K, though the footage is mostly upscaled, but I found a version that has a very good quality. I hope you uh, enjoyed the image quality here. I think it was quite decent, though I'm not 100% happy with the video itself. Still, a lot of work went into it nonetheless. I also noted it at the beginning, this video also exists in German, not this exact video, but I also made like a German analysis video for the German channel. Um, if you probably now it's too late, <laughs> I don't think you should watch that because, um, yeah, this is the more complex, longer and more detailed video, I guess. So there's nothing new in the German video. Still, um, just want to hint at the German channel in case you speak German. Also, yeah, a lot of things you can follow me on Twitter, on Instagram. You can leave a subscribe here if you want to learn more about the show or about the books of Tolkien, which I usually cover, but currently there's a lot of show content. So um, sorry for all the people waiting for other content, but currently that keeps me really, really busy. And it will keep me busy for quite some time, I guess. But after everything is covered, we return, of course, back to the books. And looking forward to that also a little bit. Maybe if no new trailer comes out, I will... I might be able to release one or two new Who is Elrond videos and maybe complete the Who is Elrond video and then we will have the very big eight hour version of it which I also will upload. So in case in your um, subscriber box an eight hour long video pops up called Who is Elrond, that's mine. But yeah, we will see that. Also, yeah, leave a like, a comment. Like I said, um, these always um, are very helpful for us creators. Thank you for all the support for the members and so on. Shout outs to them for um, supporting um, the, uh, the channel beyond that. And I don't know, there's also a gaming related channel, which currently is a bit silent. Same with my Twitch channel. I currently don't find the time to do anything else. It feels like, 
So um, yeah, it's, it was a busy month and August will also be a busy month. So there's um, a lot of stuff to come up on this channel. Also, maybe check my playlist. There is one with my best videos. There's also one which is a bit better ordered in case you are new called like Tolkien for Beginners. I'll link them in the description. Also, if you like this, maybe recommend me to other Tolkien fans you might know. And with all that said, thank you people for watching and goodbye.